here for some time now. <coughs> and this is the lips that explores how incidents from the Ramayana tradition have been staged in theatrical dramas such as Ekshagana, Kate Putra, and Nanyar Putra. Over to you. Before I move on, I just want to say that uh, Rizzio and I uh, collaborated. Uh, I asked her to translate a very, very difficult and beautiful poem from Malayalam. And I think we worked on it for three months, back and forth on email. And I was a very uh, stubborn editor because I would take uh, the poem to my class and be sure that my students understood what it meant. And, uh, I always feel that this uh, translation has really brought this poem, which was written in, I think it was 1915, has really brought it into the modern um, idiom so that it can be uh, appreciated by people who can't read it in the original poem. So translation is a, is a very important process. And uh, on the one hand, I feel that, uh, in fact, Ambai and I were just discussing this, that there has been a lot of attention to the people who actually do the translation. But what about the people whose works are translated? That's something we haven't heard too much about, and I'm eager to hear Ambai's talk because I know she's going to deal with that. But first, let me tell you a little bit about Ambai. Um, I would say that she is a person who has so many interesting projects going on simultaneously that I'm very impressed that she manages to keep them all straight. Uh, I knew her first as um, the person who wrote the first major study of women writers in Tamil. She wrote um, a book called The Face Behind the Mask. And since then, she's done a number of uh, collections of her short stories. But the interesting thing about Ambai is that her short stories, first of all, are not always short. Some of them become so interesting that they turn into almost a novella, and you're very sad when they're over because you become attached to the characters. Um, sure, her uh, the first of her collections that I read when it was translated into English was A Kitchen in the Corner of the House. This was translated by Lakshmi Holmstrom, who lives in the UK. and. Uh, that was a fascinating look at that particular short story, the way in which food is so much a part of the life of a house, and uh, really stayed with me for a long time. Um, one of my all-time favorites, I have it here in Tamil, um, in English it's called In a Forest, a Deer, and uh, one of the most amazing stories in this uh, collection is the last one, it's called Forest, and it's about Sita in the ancient period. There's one story about how Sita understands her own life. And then there's another young woman named Chandiru, uh, which means Lakshmi, and it's a modern Sita who works in Mumbai, uh, is involved in a large corporation, and then at a certain point in her life decides that she wants to go to the forest. And she actually makes a reservation in a forest, in a government uh, guest house in the forest, and it follows the lives of these two women. So you can see the ways in which ancient Sita and modern Jendiru are thinking about some of the same issues. I, I uh, really uh, enjoyed that story as a Ramayana person. I, I read it several times. Um, and then she just uh, told me that there's a new book out called A Fish in a Dwindling Lake. I'm sure it will be fascinating, and I'm sure we'll all want to get a hold of a copy. Now, that's her, her own creative work. But at the same time that she was doing that, she has been working with a group that she that is called Sparrow, and that actually sound, stands for the Sound and Picture Archives for Research on Women. And I want to just uh, bring to your attention that this is the only archive that's specifically about women in India, and she's also rather proud that it isn't in Delhi. 
that it's actually somewhere besides Delhi. Because, you know, we have the National Archives, we have all the museums, but there needs to be a little bit of decentering. And the fact that it is um, in Mumbai is something that, uh, you know, has given it its own kind of identity. Right now, she's working to build an endowment for Sparrow so that it will be able to continue. Um, and uh, a new project, or one that's almost ready to be in press, is uh, Illustrated History of Women in Tamil Nadu. And I am very much looking forward to that. So um, as, as an archivist, she has been collecting all kinds of information and memories of women who have been involved in various different projects. Um, the two books that came out of uh, some of this archive work are Singer and the Song and Mirrors and Gestures, um, one in which he interviewed a number of singers and gave you a sense of their lives and what is important to them and what they see when they look over their lives, and then Mirrors and Gestures dealing with dance. Um, and then there's one book that came out fairly recently, and I just happened to read it this week, and I really want to recommend it to you. Um, it's called The Balancing Act, and it's actually uh, a set of portraits of 21 female scientists and mathematicians that are women. And I just read the whole book from beginning to end. Um, I, I know when you think science, if you're not a scientist, you might think, oh, this will be too technical. But I thank her and um, Pooja, who's here uh, somewhere in the audience, right? Where are you? Pooja? Oh, outside. Uh, there are little boxes that tell you exactly what these technical terms mean in a way that you actually can understand them which was very helpful for me, and I found these people quite inspiring. So, you know, music, dance, science, and then uh, the last thing I want to mention is that she's now the series editor of a five, um, five volumes that are um, representing in translation works of 87 writers from 23 Indian languages. And in addition to translating either um, a, a story or poems, there is an interview with the author, which means that you can really get a sense of that author's concerns and what they see is important in their writing. So um, I would say that most people who do archiving and teaching and reading and translating really want to communicate with other people. and. I think that one of the, um, the sort of springboards of inspiration for the Leela series was to bring together people who are very interested in, communi uh, in communicating and sharing, in coming up with creative ways to work together translocally. And so I feel that um, it's a very appropriate thing that tonight we'll be having Ambai speak with us. Thank you very much, Ambai, for joining us. from Bengali, Hindi, Marathi, Gujarati, Russian stories, they all came in uh, Tamil. And for a long time we thought that Sharad Chandra was a Tamil writer. <laughs> and uh, growing up those days, reading these uh, stories in Tamil, most of us wanted to marry a Bengali man <laughs> because he was a poet and a rebel. 
All these dreams, of course, vanished when we met the Bengali man. <laughs> so the, this was the way we understood the translation. But at a point, I realized that translation was actually a way of seeing and relating, which I've been doing all my life. And that, uh, I was a translator right from the beginning because I've been translating many things. In uh, most uh, middle class uh, families, Tamil families, the girls are taught to sing. And music is something that I grew up with because my mother is a musician. So a teacher used to come home to teach me music from a very young age. And when we learn a particular uh, kind of music called varna, there is a string of swaras in between which is called chitta swaram, you know. So when I was uh, trying to sing a particular chitta swaram, the music teacher told me that imagine as if it's a flowing river then you can sing it in one breath. So suddenly, these swaras became a flowing river. They did not just for us with Sari, Gama, no. It was a flowing river which I could sing in one breath. Then later, when I was uh, put in a, a dance class, there were many adams which were taught to us, which for which we have to do bhav. So there is a song which says, Terevi varano ene chattu irimbi parano, which means, won't he come on the street and turn and look at me just a little. Now these are adams which are done by a community of great artists called Devdas. A uh, day has to wait at the window for a client to come. Of course, this song is addressed to Shiva. But a middle class Tamil girl grows up with the comments, don't stand by the window. Why are you looking out of the window? Don't laugh aloud. Don't walk fast. So when I had to do this uh, padam, I just could not get the bow. Finally, when I did, uh, did the gesture of turning and looking like this, I looked at a woman standing. Then my teacher told me, actually, only her face and her body is visible because she is standing by the window. You can't see the entire woman. But I have never stood like that. So to translate that into Bhav, I had to understand how a community of artists lived. So that was one gesture of translation. Then we had always taught the Padam, Krishna Nipegane Bharu. Krishna Nipegane Bharu means Krishna comes soon. Now this Krishna can be of many types. He is the child of Krishna. Then he is an adult Krishna who is dialing with the gopis. Then he becomes the Krishna who is a person who takes care of the world. The Jagadotarana he becomes, you know. So your bhav has to constantly change. And Krishna is not one person. He is many people. So he did take Krishna as the text. He has multiple identities and he has multiple meanings. So very soon I learned that a thing cannot remain with a single face. Everything has many faces and that is something that we have to understand. In Tamil there are words which have several meanings which cannot be translated into English with those several aspects. We have a word called Kadar. We have another word called Kamam. We have another word called Mogam. We have a word called Ichai. Then we have a word called Angu. 
Then he overheard God asking, all of which can be translated as love. But they have different meanings. Now, if we take the word karpal, normally it is used to denote love between a woman and a man. And the term nanunik adelikitin is a direct translation of I love you. Such a way of talking doesn't exist in Tamil because in Tamil we never tell anybody we love them. <laughs> Not because we don't love them, it's because we don't express it like that. So this nanunik adelikitin has come much later. It's the direct translation of I love you. But if you go to the old bhakti poetry, in Evaram, it says, Kadalagi Kashindi Kadneer Maniki. It says that in love, I melted and I shed tears. Here, the love is devotional love. It has nothing to do with uh, woman man love. Then, when you take a word like Kamam, Kamam is lust. But lust is just a transliteration. Because uh, Thiruvadur has written an entire chapter on. Uh, or Kamathupal, which talks about sex, love, relationships, so many aspects of love. So Kama is not just lust. And Mogam, Mogam we can take it as passion. But it is not just passion again. It is again a relationship where you talk about several aspects of being in love. Because we have terms like Mogamane. Mogamane means I, have, I feel enraptured. And there is a dance song which says Mogamane and Swami. It, it means like entering into passion. Mogamane, it says. It cannot be translated into English. Then there is a word, Ichche. Ichche actually means a desire. But when I say Ichche, it can be a for a thing that I want. It can be also a chai for a woman or a man. So from a small thing, it can become an, uh, a desire that uh, transcends many emotions like uh, ordinary desire, love, affection, passion, so many things. So each chai can travel several scales. So it is not just a desire. Then there is the word anbu. Anbu means love. Anbu can be between parent and child. It can be between woman and man. It can be anbu that you show towards God. Now, Bharatiya uh, has written, Thunpa ninaimugatum, shorum, vayamum ella, anbil adi madi kilike, anbil king adi which means sad thoughts, tiredness, and fear can be destroyed by love, because love is indestructible. He's actually talking of universal love, not between love, between individuals. Now, Thiruvattva says, Anvirku kundu adaikum thar arvel punkanir pushal thiru, which means, can love be locked up? When two persons meet and we see their tears, we know that they are in love. But this love, again, is not woman-man love. It can be between a parent and a child, a woman and a man, and two friends. When they share tears, you know that there is love between them. So this anger is not just love. And ashe is something that you like. I can say that I term ashe when I can uh, need, I can wish for a fruit. I can also wish for a man. When I say that our Ashyugan Tartar, I can say that she looked with love at a fruit or at a man. It doesn't have to be the way liking or wishing is understood. So there are lot of uh, layers to your word, depending uh, on the context in which these uh, words are uh, understood. Now, there is a way in which in Tamil we cover distances. A woman who is standing here next to me, like Ola, she'll be Ival. 
someone I was talking about, Anamika, I say our. But someone far away, I say poor. So when I use the word evil, everybody knows that I'm talking about somebody who is next to me. When I say our, it means somebody may be in front of me and who is somebody a little further down. But in English, you can only use the word she. I can write an entire paragraph saying that Ivar spoke to our and she looked at Ivar. <laughs> but in English, you can't translate it. I can write an entire paragraph without mentioning any names. That Ivar, 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 But uh, it's very difficult to translate into English. Now, how uh, do we uh, understand that uh, every such word as layers is it something that uh, we grew up with? Like I told you, I grew up with understanding that words are layers. But how does this understanding mature? Now, there are uh, what we call uh, folk songs or sister songs. You know. There is one song which says, Nanda Manakilo Randi, Avan Nalar Matamai Koevenai Vendi, Kondu Vanna Nurutondi, Adi Kutadi Kutadi Kotadikan. It means a mendicant in a forest. He went and begged a pot for ten months for a pot. And when he got the pot, he did not use it. He kept dancing about and he broke the pot. That is the apparent meaning. But the real meaning is that this mendicant is a human being like any one of us. And for 10 months is the time of conception. The potter is God. He gets this body, which is the pot. He doesn't know how to use the body. So he misuses the body and finally loses the pot, which is his body. That is the hidden meaning. So when we sing the song, initially as children, we have thought of fun of somebody dancing with the pot. But as we grow up, we understand that the meaning is different. All lyrics in their song, this is written by Kartwari Shifter which we grow up uh, singing, have multiple meanings. Then there is a set of poem which is called Tirumandiram. These are also written by great uh, Siddha poet Tirumunar. Now he uh, talks of an incident where a mother and child they go to a temple and uh, in a huge uh, uh, it's a wood, there is a, a elephant is carved and the child gets scared. Then the mother says that it's not an elephant, it's just a piece of wood, she says. So it goes, Marathai Maraitadu Mamadayane, Marathai Maraitadu Mamadayane. It means that the elephant got hidden in the wood and the wood hid the elephant. The world was uh, hidden when you think of only one God. And in the world God the, uh, the, the God got hidden. So there is a constant shift in meaning. Similarly, there is another one which says that the uh, jewel was hidden in the gold and the gold was hidden in the jewel. The mind was hidden by the body and in the mind was the body hidden. So it goes not like that. So actually, I am not speaking here of a gesture shift in language. That's not what I am saying. A gesture has only two images, one that is apparent and one that is hidden. Here it is not just one image, there are several layers that are uh, hidden in these uh, lines. So we can't talk of just a shift that you see the wood and you do it, it's not like that. 
What kind of wood is it? Is it sandalwood? Is it teak wood? Is it jackfruit tree wood? What wood is it? And what kind of an animal, an elephant is it? Is it an elephant in rage because it says Ma Madayane? Is it an elephant in rage? It's a, is it an elephant that's resting? Is it an elephant that is attacking? So there are many things to it. So it's not as if that we are making just one small shift in uh, language and the hidden meaning comes up. The text opens to several uh, meanings in this. Now, there are uh, certain ways that we uh, write and speak in Tamil, which are very difficult to uh, translate into English because uh, uh, they are sounds which cannot be translated. For example, uh, we say chada chada when we That means she spoke fast. But you don't get the effect of chada chada when you say she spoke fast. Then we say gidi gidi and When somebody climbs a tree, we say gidi gidi and That he climbed the tree fast. But do you get the effect of gidi gidi? You don't get that. And uh, then we say gidi gidi and he walked fast. But where is the effect of Vudu Vudu in that, you know? And uh, we say, Jala Jala Andru Oti Water flowing, Jala Jala Andru Oti We can just say, uh, this, uh, this one river was flowing, but you don't get the effect of the Jala Jala. That sound cannot be. Mada Mada Andru Oti He drank very fast. Kudu Kudu Andru Oti That he ran very fast. Shada Shada went to Krishna. That is, he, uh, uh, she spoke very fast. Pala Pala went to Mini That it shone, something was shining. So all these sounds, it cannot be translated into uh, English. And I feel that uh, when they cannot be translated into English, to some extent, that effect of that sound, that is part of the text, goes missing. And uh, it's impossible to translate such sounds. Now there is also a way of misunderstanding sounds in Tamil. Now there was a research done on a goddess called Mariam by an anthropologist from abroad. And uh, Mari is a R with a less stress, which actually means rain. But we also have another word called Mari, which is with the stress with the R, you know, which means change. So what the anthropologist did was, he said that this goddess has changing faces. That is why she is called Mariam. Then I had to point out to her that Ra is not stress. Mari means rain. Mari means change. So you cannot uh, say that she has changing faces. She doesn't have changing faces. She brings rains, which is a different thing. That sometimes it doesn't rain that way. She may have a different face. But the thing is that it's not rub, but it's rub. So I have to stress that because the sound is very important in terms of uh, translation. She may not be translating a text, but she's translating the name of a goddess. So I think that she should have been much more careful. Now this frustration about translation is not uh, something that uh, belongs only to the current times. Gallup at one point has been frustrated about not being understood. You know. So um, I read a small portion that he wrote about it. I uh, do it in my Hindi, so please forgive me if it is not good. He said, Yara, वो न समझे न समझेंगे मेरी बात या दे दे उनको और या दे मुझे जुबान और इसके तीस people have never understood what I say give them a different heart or give me a different language so this translation has been a problem for everybody not just modern authors like me but even someone like Galen has said that. And uh, 
there is always been a tussle between the text and the translator all the time, I feel. In uh, Tulsi Raman, uh, Ausulia says at uh, one point, she says that the lotus blooms when it sees the sun only so long as it is standing in a pond of water. When the water dries, the same suns can squash the lotus and kill it. And I always apply this beautiful image to it for translation. Only so long as the text remains in its contextual waters with its elements and emotions, can it come alive with the sun that is translation. When it is taken away from the contextual waters, then the text dies. So I always apply this imagery for uh, translation. There is a way in which uh, translation is applied to reinterpret uh, aspects of culture. There was another anthropologist who uh, wanted to see in terms of images limits that are set for women. She said that saris have borders. So, it means that women's lives have limitations. And the word we use for sari is kare, with a small ra, without stress. But there is another word called kare, with the stress of the R, which means the stain. She said, kare is border, kare is also a stain. So the women are limited, limited, and when they cross the limit, there is a stain on their character. She understood it like that. When I met her, I had to point out that even dhotis are borders. Dhotis that men wear, they are borders. And I told her that there is a difference between ra and ra. And another thing I told her was, who told you that all women in India wear sarees? It's a myth that it's a national dress. I said, it's not. I said, have we gone through India completely? I said, most women wear salwar kameez in Punjab. I said, they wear a different kind of dress in the northeast. I said, that the sari is not a national dress at all. And I said that if you are applying to Tamil women, I said that even among the Tamil women, the tribal women wear uh, saris differently. They don't wear saris, they wear a different kind of dress. So I told them that this is a very uh, wrong way of looking at uh, culture and at terms in language. As for uh, my own experience of being translated, when uh, my story gets translated and it comes to me, uh, initially, uh, I feel quite alienated from the English text and uh, it takes me time to accept it as my story. Sometimes when I have to read out stories uh, to an audience, I read a line and suddenly I think, did I say that? Because that's not the way I said it uh, in Tamil. Because the image has changed, the color has changed, the sound has changed. And suddenly I'm reading it and I start wondering, is it what I've written? And I have to check my power to see whether that's what I wrote, you know. And uh, in uh, 92, I was in the University of uh, Chicago as Rockefeller Scholar. And I had an opportunity to work with my very good friend, uh, A.K. Ramanujan. We had a very good uh, friendship between us. And uh, he said that he wanted to translate one of my stories. I said, okay, go ahead and translate. But I told him that, look, uh, I'm not an author who is dead because he has been translating Bhakti Pavits. So I said that I'm very much alive and I'm going to see the translation and uh, you, you should allow me to participate in the translation. He said, of course. He said, you're not so difficult to translate. I translated Bhakti Pavits, he told me. And then he translated my whole story in overnight. He translates very fast. <laughs> then uh, next morning he called me and told me, see, here is your story. 
So I saw the story. And uh, in one place, the uh, uh, woman character in the story, she called her husband Morgan. Morgan in uh, Tamil is a violent man. Actually, she calls him a toughie, you know, in jest. Then in another place, I said, Morgan Tanamana Nagarum Maganangar. That means violently moving vehicles. But uh, Raman thought it was a Murg of Sanskrit. He thought it was idiotic. So he said, the woman calls her husband, you're an idiot. Then at one point he said, idiotically moving vehicles. <laughs> I told him, Raman vehicles can't move idiotically. <laughs> he said, well, uh, Murg is the same thing. So I rushed to the University of Chicago Library and uh, I saw under the dictionary and it, I was right, Murgam meant violence. And at the bottom of it, there was another word called Murki, which means a very stubborn woman. You know? <laughs> so I uh, photocopied the page and I rushed to Brahman. And I told Brahman, see, you're wrong. I, I'm right. And I told him, do you see the Murki at the bottom? I said, that's me, you know. <laughs> you're not going to translate my story the way you want, you know. So we had a good laugh about it because he was such a close friend. I could tell him all this, you know, and we could uh, fight about it. And, uh, but uh, he held on to his views and he didn't change uh, those words. He said, I'm not going to change it. That's the way I have interpreted it. Later on, when the story was translated by Lashmi Armstrong, I told him, you please change it. Then there was another uh, image where I said it was about the city of Bombay and how a girl gets used to the city of Bombay. So I have said at one point that the city lay like a demon. So uh, Raman translated it as city looks like a demon. So I told him, Raman, that's not correct. He said, but what is the difference? I told him a city that lies like a demon demon, it's harmless. It doesn't do anything to you. It just lies there. It's huge, but it doesn't hurt you in any way. But the city that looks like a demon is dangerous. We have changed my image and I won't agree to that, you know. So he told me, you can't be so finicky, Lakshmi. I said, yeah, I can be very finicky. <laughs> and uh, so when you work with translators, then that is when you realize that as an author you have to be alive. You know, it's very easy to translate dead writers who would come, come and fight with you. But uh, uh, writers who are alive like me have to fight back. And I feel that uh, in the process of translation, especially when we translate Indian literature into English, there is a great need to make the text completely understood. So you find that they translate our uh, stories with millions of footnotes. And the footnotes will be about food. That idli is a steamed pancake. And the murukha is something that is done with, uh, it's a circular thing done with, in circular motion done with hand. <laughs> Then uh, suji rava will become broken wheat, uh, broken wheat with salt, <laughs> make it look so exotic. And uh, I remember at one point in one story, they had footnoted dhoti, you know. They had written that it is something like a sarong. <laughs> so I said, who is going to footnote sarong? Are you saying everybody knows sarong? No, only dhoti has to be footnoted. And then they put not relations, you know, like we say Amma, Aya, in Marathi we say Ai. They want to translate all those things. Then I had to point out that uh, as a young person, when we were reading literature from West, translated from French and so many other languages, the French novels had such exotic words, you know. But we didn't even know how to pronounce champagne at that time. And we just thought it must be a great drink because everybody was having it to celebrate. And there was also some nice French food which we didn't understand what it was. But we just read and passed it on, you know. So 
So why should our food be educated? Let them wonder about it, you know. Let them be some wonder. Let them wonder what Muruku is. I don't have to tell them what Muruku or Dosha or Idli or Sampar or Rasam is, you know. I don't have to make my culture available to them completely. And the trouble is that when you translate for Western readers, you want them to, you want to tell them, look, we also have good writers. Please read them and this is how you read them. You have to explain. But do explain to us how to read a uh, writer from a part. Who taught us how to read Marcus? Nobody could not read for us. It is because the journey is upwards for us. For them, they are throwing it down at us, you see. They have to get to receive it and take it the way it comes. But we have to make everything easy for them to understand. We have to spoon feed them and tell them, this is the story. This is the way the story should be understood. We have to explain every bit of the text to them. So when we do this, we have to present the culture in all its format, then it restricts the choice of the text. Very often translators have asked me, have you written a story on dowry death? Have you written a story on child marriage? So these are the things, have you written a story on rape? These are the kind of things they want because it makes a particular culture exotic. These are the things that happen. So far, nobody has asked me whether they have written on snakes and tigers. But, uh, but they may ask, you know. Because I think that it is like you're fulfilling some demand. Have you written about girls being seen for marriage? It was something that we take for granted in our culture, which we won't notice as a peculiar thing in our culture. They would like me to write about it. And uh, this is the way that they can approach the Western market. And uh, about the Western readers, what surprises me is that uh, in a story I had written, Udaldan uh, Shirei, Udaldan Pudadale, Body is Prison, Body is Freedom. But when it was translated, the translator wrote, body is present all right, but she wrote, through body freedom. I said, why didn't you write, body is freedom? She said, the Western readers won't understand it. I said, the Western readers must be very stupid because the Indian travel readers have understood it. So why can't the uh, English readers understand it? Then there was another story in which I had uh, referred to body many times. So the translator asked me whether I could turn, wherever I have written body, whether I could turn it into self. I told you, you certainly can't. How can the body be turned into self? I am talking about the body, you know. You can't say it's self. Self is within the body. It's not something separate. As you have to write it as body. And she felt constrained to write it as body. And uh, there is another thing also, how they uh, present uh, an author. Now, in the Tamil literary world, when a writer is translated into English, it's a promotion. You are being read by many other. So the, what the writer would do is he would hand over the text to the translator and say, do with it what you want. You just translate me into English because I want many people to read it. It's a kind of a promotion. So the way they would choose the text, the author, and all will depend on the translator. Even the stories will be chosen by the translator. And also how they would like to present you. Now, in the double literary world, the women writers grow old. But the male writers become gurus. They never grow old. When they become older, they become gurus. But the women writers only get old. So whenever in a particular meeting, when they want to present uh, a writer, like let's say my age, 
there was a motor retirement, which means old senior writer. A male writer of my age will be just presented at the writer. So I used to go and ask him, why did he keep on presenting me as Muthar talent? My hair is grey, but his hair is also grey. Why don't he call him Muthar an old writer, you know? But it's just not done because women age, but men don't. And as men age, they become wise. But women only grow old. The wisdom doesn't come to them, according to them. And uh, sometimes the translators also catch on to it. When you're a young writer, they would present you as a rebel uh, who is a feminist. And uh, as you grow old and maybe reach my age, they suddenly start saying that uh, Ambaya has given up her feminist polemics and now she has become a spiritual seeker. But who told you that? I never told you that. <laughs> I never said that. I mean, from my first story, where I've been reading all these Devaram and all these songs, they are all about spiritual uh, life of uh, bhakti poets. So how can it suddenly become a spiritual speaker just because I have crossed 60 years, you know? And how can you say I have given up my feminist uh, ideas because I am running an organization with a feminist perspective? But these are their ways of saying that it's like saying that don't think that she has just grown old. She has also become wise and has become a spiritual seeker. I wonder what it's going to be before 20 years old, the more, more can I speak, I wonder. But the ways of presentations are like this. And uh, there's a constant tussle between the writer and the translator. And this has to do with the uh, politics of translation, where there is hidden power for the translator. I attended one. Uh, translation conference, which I told all about, where only the translators spoke. The authors did not allow to speak at all. We were just sitting there. We had to go to some places and read out the Tamil part of our stories, which the translator read in English. But in the conference, the authors never spoke. Only the translators spoke about the difficulties of translation. But the author had to speak about our difficulties of accepting the translation. <laughs> and nobody asked us to speak. It was a trans the conference abroad. They spent all that money to just ask me to come and sit there and do nothing. Where uh, the current trend of uh, translation is uh, concerned, I once attended a translation conference in which a translator came and told me that uh, as far as he is concerned, the author is dead. Only the text remains. And he said this is a very postmodern way of looking at uh, translation. And uh, he said that uh, there is always a way in which he gives a twist to the translation and it does some mischief with the translation which the author cannot object to. So I told him that's fine, but you will never translate my story till I'm dead, you see. I have to be really dead for you to translate my story and not just a metaphorically dead. So I, I don't think that uh, stories are about uh, uh, hiding and revealing. Stories are, I mean, stories are not about hiding and revealing, that a text is translated and it is revealed through translation. But stories are about hiding and revealing, not just in one way. There are several layers which will reveal itself to different readers in different ways. The current way of translation is to open up all the layers as if opening its underbelly and making it transparent. Whereas I feel that uh, everything about the story need not be understood. Some stories are understood over a period. Some stories are understood immediately. It's like music. You go and attend a classical music concert, you understand the halap entirely. You don't. 
Not you understand the way that a rag is delineated and rendered, but you enjoy the same rag in different manners, in different ways. A text is like that. It doesn't have to be revealed totally. Because once you do that, then the text goes away from you. The idea is for the text to remain with you. So I feel that some mysteries must remain. And some authors must not die. Thank you. Thank you, Ambai, for a talk that uh, has both humor and uh, many points that translators should take into account. Um, I want to just uh, mention a couple of things. First, um, I remember once uh, you gave a reading at the University of Texas in Austin, and you said, I'm going to read a story that most Westerners don't associate with India. And it was a lovely short story about a young woman who was swimming in a, river, a, story. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> in a river, and uh, it was just a wonderful story about the pleasures of swimming in a river. And I've always remembered that story because, you know, there are these books like about this issue or that issue, and you have one author from each country who's writing about it. And, I really do think that sometimes that narrows the topic rather than expanding it. And uh, sometimes it's the subject matter that you wouldn't necessarily expect that opens things out. Um, I also like this idea that the text doesn't have to be translated totally. Uh, I think there's something about the way um, graduate school is that if you leave out any detail, you feel that you haven't done your duty. Uh, and in a sense, um, sometimes a term that is untranslated can be the key to the story, and if you don't understand that, you miss something. But on the other hand, there are times, even in one's own language, when one has to keep reading the story over and over again and understanding the meaning of the context. So, you know, that is also part of uh, ordinary understanding in your language or in someone else's. Um, I, I feel that uh, it's also the case that some of the best translations will come when the author and the translator find an innovative way to be neither too literal nor to go too far from what really impels the and it's very hard. But some of the most interesting translations come out of that kind of intersection yes. between those two. Yeah, that's true. And uh, mm -hmm. it sounds like you and Roman almost did that, but you were both too stupid. And it never <laughs> came to the point where you rose above what you were doing and found another way to do it. Uh, and this is in spite of the fact that uh, I work with my translator and I have a wonderful friendship with her. Mm -hmm. But uh, it, it becomes very tough when uh, some of the things that are the cultural things, because she lives abroad, she is not able to capture them. In fact, in one of Bama's story, um, a child is waiting for a mother who has gone to work in the fields. And she says, um, in the Kartikapoy kind of mom, in um, rural uh, Tamil Nadu, the word the card is not forest. It means agricultural field. And the Lakshmi Armstrong has translated this, which forest has my mother gone to work? You don't go to work in a forest. You go to work in an agricultural field. And I pointed it out to Bama. She said I didn't notice it. Because she also worked with Bama. But Bama didn't notice it. Because uh, there are certain terms, you know, like uh, in rural agricultural India, they, uh, Nadu, they use the word kupa, by which they don't mean garbage. They mean the plants that have grown around, you know, to be weeded away. They call it kupa. So you have to understand those things. And sometimes it doesn't happen when you have not uh, lived in Nadu for a long time, you know. About... Uh, which is the correct way of rendering a translation? 
Yeah, I would tell uh, two Zen stories because I'm a storyteller. There was a Zen guru who went into a cave to do uh, tapas here and he came out after some time. And the king called him to the court and asked him, uh, what is the wisdom that you've got? You know? So he had a flute tucked at his waist and he took out the flute and he played a few pleasant notes and he walked away. Because the wisdom that he gained cannot be totally explained. There was another uh, Zen guru who had a very ardent uh, student who learned everything possible from him. And the guru lay dying, you know. And the student went up to him and asked him, have I um, learned everything about Zen? The guru said, yes, but you're still stinking of Zen. <laughs> there is a way in which you should uh, also come away from the text in order to translate it. The uh, translation can't stink of the uh, text, you see. So these are two acts which I constantly remember when translation work has to be done. I don't want to take any more time. I want to open this discussion up to the audience. Mike, do you want to recognize people and answer their questions? Yeah, I don't mind if they have questions. Okay. We're open to questions. I want to ask you about Indian writers writing in English. Writing in English? Yes. Or do you feel that, uh, let's say for example, Salman Rushdie, when he's talking about an Indian phenomenon, I mean, written as children, for example, he repeatedly uses the phrase, phrase, really, truly. I mean, for somebody who speaks in colloquial Hindi, that would immediately make sense because he keeps saying sachi mochi, which really is garbage, but it conveys a deeper meaning than simply saying either really or truly. So do you think that's a very general phenomenon? In that any Indian author is mentally translating from a more familiar language into English when writing in English. Actually, uh, for uh, many writers who write in English, English is their mother tongue, you know. It's uh, not uh, possible for them to write in their own whatever man. Like Shashi Desh Pandey, it would be difficult for her to write in Kannada. Because she studied in an English medium school and the English is a language. So when she writes in English, I wouldn't uh, doubt that she is translating from uh, something like that. And I think that uh, um, as far as what I read about uh, um, Indian writers in English, there is this urge to exoticize some aspects, you know, which in a language writing we would take uh, casually. We won't exaggerate a particular way of dressing or food or something like that. Whereas a particular kind of food can be turned into an exotic thing in English writing. So that thing is there because they cater to a different kind of uh, readership. So I find that a uh, lack. And I also uh, find that a very self-conscious way of looking at certain things in your culture. Something that we take very casually, the English writers would particularize it and uh, kind of exaggerate it and write a paragraph about it, you know, because it is something nice for the uh, Western readers to read. When I read those things, I pass them because it, it's known to me, I don't need it. Hello. Hi. Yeah. Uh, I was actually uh, interested by the fact that you want to have a have an authorial intervention. In uh, authorial intervention. Yes. Yes. During yes. your work yeah. getting translated, uh, there was a small point what I wanted to ask. Uh, that you said uh, when you were checking with uh, one of the translators, you didn't find the word convey what you meant, and then you referred back to your own text. Mm -hmm. In such situations, uh, is it uh, that you are looking at the text, what you wrote then, or is that, ha uh, or will that have changed for you also? No, actually, what you uh, meant or what you yeah meant? yeah you're right. What I meant was that the translation was not wrong, but you know the uh, when I write in Tamil, uh, image 
and the color and the songs are different. Suddenly when I see it translated in English, it conveys the meaning, but I don't get the sound and the image that has gone with the Tamil thing. So I refer to my text to see, is this what I said? You know? Like, for example, in Tamil, uh, when I write, I say that somebody touched me with the cool hands. Because ours is a tropical country. Somebody touches you with cool hands, it's wonderful. But when you write in English, you can't say somebody touched me with cold. You say somebody touched me with warm hands. Because warmth is needed there. So when it is translated as warmth in English, then suddenly when you pick my text, what did I write? You know? So there is this kind of variation that comes. That's what I was referring to. I was not saying that the translation was wrong. The translation was trying to render it in the best possible way, you know. Because in English, certain things have to be said in certain ways, you know. Like if I've written an entire paragraph saying the world, the world, the world, then in English they would give a name to those characters so that there is no misunderstanding as to who is speaking to whom, you know. So those things, when I read, suddenly I think them at this part what I wrote, you know. Because you can write an entire story without um, uh, giving uh, the person's name or without saying I, just using the verb, I can write the story, an entire story I can write. And I also wanted to com comment on a little thing that uh, the cultural context needs to be maintained. Uh, that I think uh, uh, every language has its own cultural context, like uh, in case of the Wuthering Heights, the Moors, the concept of the Moors uh, can yeah. be conveyed. So, and, uh, um, yeah, no, uh, uh, I was talking about the cultural context in terms of how it is explained. That when we read the Western stories, uh, nobody explains the cultural context to us. You read Gone with the Wind without knowing what South America was, isn't it? We know nothing about slavery, but then we start reading Gone with the Wind. Nobody put notes it for us. They have a certain way of dressing in the South of America. We don't know about it. But here everything is explained. So I think that why should a culture be offered on a platter to others? You know? Let some mysteries remain. Let us find out what it is. You know? And such finding out may take time. So we don't have to make it easy for people. Hi, my name is Kat. Uh, you talked about politics and translation. So can you talk more on this and how do you say this, politics and translation? Yeah, the uh, politics of translation, I understand it as a, a phenomenon where the translator has a, a lot of power over the writer in terms of the choice of text, in terms of presentation of the author. There was a one book of mine uh, in a forest study which was translated where the publishers asked the translator to dedicate the book. So she dedicated it to her daughters. And uh, she didn't uh, sign her name, so ma many people thought that they were my daughters. So because normally the author uh, dedicates the uh, book, that is one thing. Another thing is that uh, when I talked to the publisher about it, the publishers told me the original story is yours. The English translation belongs entirely to the translator, which I don't agree with. Where is the translation without the author? Okay. If the English translation has to be on to her, she has to write her own story. She can't translate mine. So I think that the author also has to have some right over the translation, the copyright. That when the copyright, the translation is used, I can also have to say that this person cannot use my translated story. But the entire right goes to the translator, not the writer. That is one way. And another thing is that uh, the way the uh, translator uh, wants to use certain aspects of the story. That earlier one translator once told me that uh, I translated the story of yours and I noticed that she had missed an entire page. So I asked her, um, why did you do that? She said, I thought that it was overwriting. So I said, well, it is what I am. 
If you want to translate my story, don't sit in judgment of it. You write your own story. And I tell you what you have overwritten. <laughs> so then she never translated my story after that. The problem comes when it is translated into languages you don't know. Like maybe Spanish, Swedish, in which my stories have been translated. But I did a diploma in Spanish, so I know a little bit of Spanish. So when a Spanish friend of mine did a story of mine, long story, I told her that you sent me the Spanish translation, so let me take a look at it. And uh, I noticed that at one place where I had uh, written that the sea was blue, <coughs> she had written the sea was green. So I wrote, she's a close friend of mine, so I wrote her and asked her, the Alexander, you have written that the sea is green, but actually it is blue in the story. She said, oh, you're so right, because the sea outside my window is green. So I wrote green, uh, you noticed it, she said. You know. I said that I don't know so much Spanish like you, but I can understand. And once my story was translated into French, there is an instinctive way you understand when something is missing. So I first looked at the dialogue part, you know, and I noticed that uh, my dialogues were in ten lines, but the French dialogues were in six lines. So I noticed that she had missed four lines. And I saw the last uh, paragraph, and I know what exactly I've written in the last paragraph, and what the French words could be for that. And those words didn't exist. Then I realized that the last paragraph had been cut off. Inadvertently, they had uh, not done it at all. So I wrote to them saying that this uh, translation is not right. I don't know the language. My uh, ten stories of mine were translated into Swedish. But I sat with the Swedish translator. I asked her to read it out to me and I told her I know, don't know Swedish at all. But from the sound of it, I can tell you what you have missed. You know? And I could tell her. And we had a very good uh, way of working together because we went line by line. And I sat with my Tamil work, not the English one, so that she could get the right one. When my stories were translated into Marathi, it was much easier. When it is translated from one Indian language to another, it becomes much easier. It's much easier to uh, do it directly. Nowadays, there are not many people who know two languages. So they keep your double text and an English thing and then they translate. So I like to work with my you know, translators so that they don't miss out or anything. I'm not saying that they should get everything. Uh, they have as much freedom to use words in Marathi about which I may not know. But I don't want them to say the wrong thing entirely. You know? Like in uh, one story I had written that the uh, uh, children were listening to it with great excitement as if they were Harry Potter stories. Now the translator thought that in a Tamil story, why is she writing about Harry Potter? So she said that they listened to it with great excitement like Hari Katha stories. I said, it's not Hari Katha, it's Harry Potter. She said, uh, she said you mean uh, this the Tamil uh, uh, they know about Harry Potter? I said, of course. I said, in which world are you living? <laughs> so it's, these are the things which I don't want them to miss. You know. And also the uh, cultural context change is in one interview, one uh, musician had told me that when she was a young girl, you know, she was five years old, when she was learning Veena from a guru, she stayed with him, her mother just left her with the guru. She was very strict. So when she played rock, he used to beat her up. You know. Then in the night, uh, he didn't have children. So she used to sleep with him and his wife. So he used to feel bad for beating her up, you know. So he used to caress her. And uh, then put her to sleep, you know. I didn't see there was anything wrong with that. Then my publisher told me that there are some things uh, very, very uh, shocking in this interview. I said, what is shocking? She said that, you know, that is child abuse, she told me. That he's caressing a five-year-old child. I said, my God, it's not that at all. Because now everything is seen in that context, you see. That, then I told her that that's not so. Actually, he's an old uh, teacher and he's gently touching her. That's all. He's not doing child abuse. You know? So you get uh, very scared to do certain gestures or write in certain ways. You know? 
like uh, I have a habit of uh, touching and talking, you know. I keep on touching people when I talk to them, who that they have, you know. And once uh, an American had uh, come, and uh, with so many things we agreed with, you know. So I was so thrilled, I was touching her all the time. You know? So after some time, she told me that I'm so sorry, I'm not a lesbian. <laughs> <laughs> I was shocked. I don't know, I'm also not a lesbian. And she said, no, but you touch me so many times. I said, in India, we touch all the time. We're not lesbians, you know, just because we don't touch somebody. So the cultural context changes all the time, you see. So I want people to get those nuances and not miss them. Uh, the cultural context, ma'am, uh, oh, sorry, uh, the cultural context that you spoke about, do you think over the years, I mean, there's, there's a certain homogenization happening, have translators also become lax? Translators have also become? Become lax? I mean, have they accepted homogeneity and not look for variations where there might be variations? Yeah, actually it's not uh, that uh, they become lax. Uh, what happens is that uh, um, many of the translators uh, are those who live abroad. And the translators here, those who are translators, they feel that uh, if you do certain things in English language, it is fine, you know that uh, you don't have to particularly present a certain thing in a certain way. If you take it away from the cultural context of it, it doesn't matter. Because I think that it matters, you know. Not because uh, of anything, but because certain stories are so much rooted in a uh, culture, you know. You can't homogenize it. It's not possible. You know, I know we all live in a global village or whatever, but it is still, the language is still there, you know, and it carries with it certain roots which you cannot take away, I feel. <coughs> uh, I'm Bhagavadajan from uh, Delhi University, ma'am. I have two questions to ask you. Number one is, uh, what do you think about this transliteration? Like, uh, 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 one story, a novel which I read, when uh, it has been translated from Tamil to English, mm -hmm. certain words have been transliterated. Mm -hmm. Right, and I felt that by this transliteration, I don't know, to an extent I could feel closer to the Tamil text. Mm -hmm. Since I know Tamil, that's it. Mm -hmm. And my second question is, can you please uh, elaborate a little bit on the post-2000 uh, translations which are avoiding footnotes? Can you elaborate more on that? Though so you, so you have given an idea about it during your speech, can you elaborate more on this? Why this exclusive, uh, clear tendency of avoiding the footnotes, especially after 2000, please? Yeah, I think that uh, until 2000, this footnoting uh, went on, and then uh, many authors uh, objected to it. And uh, uh, we said that uh, these are words, like especially relationships like Appa, Amma, and all should be footnoted. You know? And everything need not be like, uh, you write a story called Yellowfish, it's just a yellowfish, you know. But they would say that yellow is also the color of turmeric. <laughs> Why you ask? But who told you to write all that? You know, it's like, and turmeric is an auspicious root, and it will go on like that. You know? so, but you have not written about the yellow fish because yellow is the color of turmeric. You see? This is an addiction that can be avoided. Yes, maybe it is easier to understand a uh, text if you transliterate it. But the idea is, do you want to understand the text or do you want to explore the text? Do you want to enter the text and explore it by yourself? Or do you want to be spoon-fed and told every word with its little meaning? It depends on you. Have I answered your question? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm pondering over it. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, have you ever found any of your translations uh, faithful or even in a better in a better way or uh, with a, what do you say uh, with better spark or something you know, which like uh, you like the translation better than your own work? <laughs> uh, have you ever? <laughs> <laughs> 
translations that have uh, been done by Lakshmi Ostrom, they are extremely good translations. Uh, I won't talk about the faithful, but because that is very tough in uh, some of my stories. But uh, I'm very happy with the uh, translation in general. I have great differences with her. I think that I continue. But uh, there is never a time when I have liked the uh, English translation better than uh, the original, not just of mine, but even other stories, uh, like stories of maybe Tija Nagiraman Mauni or uh, someone like even Jai Kant, and I prefer the original, definitely, because I think that the original gives me a different experience than the uh, translated uh, story, you know. And uh, in uh, the Tamil literary world, there is no, um, we don't have reading sessions where we come and read our stories and all. Reading sessions are there only in English, you know. So uh, colleges and others started inviting me only when my stories got translated into English. So I had to go and read my story in English, which was a very strange experience for me. Because uh, until my middle school, I didn't study in English. I studied in a Tamil medium school. And uh, I can count and curse only in Tamil. And uh, I can't do it in English. When I'm very angry, I break into Tamil. I can't, and uh, I find it extremely difficult to speak continuously English, and I'm constantly translating in my mind from uh, Tamil to English, you know. And uh, I can write non-fiction in English. At my research work, I can do it in English. But uh, fiction, I can never write in English. It's just not possible to do creative work uh, in uh, English for me, you know. I tried uh, uh, writing uh, some poetry and you know, it's so bad that I stopped writing that. Like I mean, in English, it's very tough for me to write in English because I find the constant limitation in my own uh, use of the language because that's not the language I've been using all along, you see. It is only much later in my life that I read English literature books. Earlier, I've been reading only Tamil literature books, you see. So my entire uh, Language is formed through Tamil literature. It's very difficult to write in uh, English. So even when I read a good English translation, I still prefer my own uh, original uh, stories. Yeah, she was translated. Uh, it's still a translation question then. What do you think is more difficult to translate? A descriptive passage or a dialogue between two characters? Because when it's two characters, there's also another genre, uh, uh, which is uh, their characterization and their flavor needs to come out. So what do you think is more difficult? A description or a dialogue exchange? Both difficult, but I feel a dialogue is more difficult. Because, uh, you know, recently uh, we went and interviewed a um, folk artist from the Salem district. And there are many colorful ways of uh, speaking, you know. So when you ask them, uh, how, how much have you been uh, earning? You know? So they said that uh, it is uh, uh, enough to go on. You know, it's like uh, earning but not having a mat to sleep on. Now, having a mat to sleep on when I say it in English, it means nothing. But what is the pile language is a big thing in Tamil, you know. That's one thing. And another thing is, she says that you should not have, you should not do empty posting when you don't have grass to feed your buffalo. It's a very colorful way of saying it. But what does it mean in English? <laughs> Who has buffalo at home to give grass? You see, see, these dialogues are very difficult to translate unless you kind of explain what they are, you know. Descriptive passages are difficult, but you can overcome the difficulties. Dialogues are very difficult. Also because there are different ways of speaking Tamil, you see, from in different areas. And which book of yours do you think does this best so that we can try and read both versions? To which speak? book of, your, of yours is translated, which has the best translation of dialogues? I think that uh, uh, where dialogues are concerned, Lakshmi Armstrong has done a good job in all my uh, books. 
except a few parts where, uh, where I spoke about body is prison and body is freedom, those kind of things. Other than that, I think she has tried her best to get the dialogues across. Because we work over the draft several times. She translates and sends it to me, then I look at it, and I tell her that this is not what I meant really, and this is not what the character means. Because sometimes she misunderstands who is talking to whom. Because of the evil hour, you know, she forgets it, so I have to point it out. I just end with a very cheeky question. When you speak in English, you say, you know all the time. Yeah. What will it be in Tamil? When you're speaking in Tamil, what would you say instead of you? Oh, it's Leah. Leah. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for that wonderful lecture. And uh, I, I'm just looking at the last part of your uh, you know, authors who refused to die. Uh, and this is kind of thinking aloud. You know, however uh, hard we refuse to die, at some point you will have to die uh, in terms of, in legal terms also, because you know, after some time you have, it's free for all. And, uh, and we have also been, as readers, we have also been all the time interpreting uh, different writers, you know, every reading is a sort of translation that way. So, uh, it, when you're looking at it that way, how do you, how do you look at this, you know, it's a problematic, like how long can you, as you rightly mentioned, there are also other languages which you do not know. So, uh, is, is it possible at all to kind of, and it's also about the copyright issue, because yeah. it's got legal um, implications. When you are uh, talking about a translator's version of a of a writer, which the author may not even vouch for, but still it is her version. So is there is it is it possible at all to think like that? Like, because you know, at some point it becomes open, and you know, you have uh, there is no physical way of holding onto a text. It's not a physical holding onto the text as much as once the author has asserted that this is the way the text is uh, going to be and this is the way I would like the text to be uh, seen. She has laid the ground for the translators. Once she has done that, I don't mind moving away from the text because some of the old stories, people are translating again and again. But the ground has been set that I'm not an author who is going to uh, say that I'm not going to have any say on the text. Once those assertions have been made, then it is open. Then it's open for people, you know. That I don't mind. But when the assertions are not made at all, you know, then what happens is the translation becomes an attempt by the translator. Whereas I feel that in, if there is initial collaboration, once I've established the facts and I've laid the ground for the rules of translation, then it is okay. Because one can't hold on to a text bit other. But, uh, our own interaction with texts which whose authors are not alive, or you know, the texts which we have discovered later. Yeah. So how do we deal with this? Like the Bhakti poetry. And yeah. No, whatever. So how do we uh, approach this? Do we have two different types of uh, looking at this whole issue of yeah. translation? But I think that we, when we deal with Bhakti poets or what I call dead authors. One has to do it with uh, great humility, I feel. There is a six-line poem of a Chinese uh, poet, uh, which has been translated many, many times. And the book has come out saying 19 ways of looking at this poem. And they have debated about whether light fell on certain things or above, you know. So I think that such discussions will go on. But uh, such discussions can happen only when you look at a text with humility, not as something that you're looking at it in a patronizing way, that you've taken these bhakti portraits and now we we'll render them in training. I don't think that is the way to see. The entire act of the translation has to be done with the great humility. Sadan Menon, and he's going to talk 
on state of art institutions in India. And please come for that lecture. And if you have not left your emails with us, please do. And come back, thank you very much. Uh, Paula, thank you so much. Did you speak loudly? <laughs> 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 because in the afternoon we had a discussion that uh, in uh, South Indians speak very loudly. We can't speak uh, softly. We are a great terror for lovers because we can't speak softly at all. And uh, he told me, yes, you speak very loudly. <laughs>